Hey there, welcome. This is Nero 102. Um, I am, uh, my name is Sharif. I am uh, excited to be uh, talking to you about uh, Near for Ethereum developers. This is the second time we've run this workshop. Uh, the first one is recorded, and uh, so will this one be. And uh, I'll leave the link in the same place. So just in the in the chat message, I, I actually have the the chat up here on one screen, and, and I can see the presentation here in another. Um, hey, how's it going, Miko? So um, <clears throat> so. Um, you know, if you're asking questions while I'm talking, uh, I'll, I'll do my best to, to kind of stop and, and engage with you. Uh, so I'm, I'm highly interrupted, <clears throat> inter uh, interruptible. Uh, feel free to, to, to just, uh, you know, uh, type in if you, if you notice me talking about something maybe off topic or you want me to dig into something, uh, speed up or slow down. I'm, I'm wide open to that sort of feedback. <clears throat> I think before we get started, um, I just want to uh, point out, so the, the slides that I'm, I'm working through are here. And um, I just posted a link to the to the chat, and uh, on those slides are a couple of steps. So if, if you've never installed a Node.js locally, I, I wouldn't recommend doing that right now. Uh, depending on your operating system, it might uh, take you a few more minutes uh, than you'd expect. But you can install near CLI locally. It's a npm application you can install on the shell, and and then you can uh, create a testnet account on your protocol. That's just a couple of minutes. You should totally do that. Um, and then on that first slide, you'll see the uh, recording from last week on Crowdcast. And, and then this one will be just added right on top of that one uh, to the top of the stack there. So you'll be able to see both of these recordings. So <clears throat> in terms of how we'll spend our time together, you know, an hour, hour and a half, whatever it is uh, right now. Um, and to make sure that we get the most out of this, um, I, I just want to invite uh, a couple of, of uh, different um, uh, different people uh, to, to join me in, in different ways. So if you work with the Near Collective or you work have been working with Near for a while, or um, you, um, uh, you're you comfortable with the subject, or you're comfortable with Ethereum, and, and you want to uh, join me on stage, you're more than welcome to do that to make for a more interactive, uh, you know, engaging presentation. So it's not just like, you know, one talking head, uh, uh, you know, for, for the next, uh, for the next bit. So you're, you're more, more than welcome to do that. Just, you know, let me know in the, in the chat, and I can invite you uh, with a quick click. So no, no problem. Um, <clears throat> the, the second thing is, if you've already seen this workshop, or uh, you've been working with near maybe you're hacking on near right now for the the hack the rainbow um, event uh, and you you want to contribute to the conversation you know either answering questions or, or asking more advanced questions feel free to dive in um, I uh, you know if I can't answer something I'll, I'll let you know but I'll do my best to uh, to address whatever questions come come my way so um, I just want to quickly get a sense of, of who's here uh, so I'll make a quick poll um, let's say um, are you an Ethereum, I keep misspelling Ethereum developer. Um, what's that? Um, yes, for uh, almost a year now, or um, Okay, so uh, just give me a sense if, if you've worked um, uh, uh, with Ethereum uh, before, it would be good to get a sense of, of who's all in the audience. Uh, so that, that's, one, uh, that's one question. Um, and I just want to get a sense, like, are, have you built on Ethereum? You know, who, who's all here and, and have you worked with Ethereum before? So a poll should have appeared on your screen somewhere. Please uh, take just a second to pick one of those items. Uh, are you an Ethereum developer? Either what's that? Yes, for almost a year. Or, you know, you, you paired with Vitalik. Uh, I think he went to University of Waterloo. Um, and then um, also, uh, are you a software developer? So I, you know, I guess that'll, it's kind of covered in the first one. So I'm going to leave it at that. Okay, so any any responses to this poll? I'm, I'm not seeing much action here yet. What's that? So Ethereum uh, is uh, uh, is uh, is the 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 other uh, network. Um, that <clears throat> that's actually the the, the big one, uh, and um, and so uh, if you're if you're not familiar with Ethereum, I, I would recommend that you take a look at it. If you're if you're joking, uh, then you know, haha. -ha. Um, and it looks like someone paired, paired with Vitalik in, in Waterloo on this stuff. So that, that's great. Welcome. 
Um, okay, so uh, for sure, if if you're an Ethereum developer and you're um, uh, you're you're deep in the weeds on this stuff, then you're going to find what I'm saying pretty pretty lightweight about Ethereum. So I'm I'm not an Ethereum developer. I know near, and uh, um, and and I've you know I've read a little bit about Ethereum. I've I've poked at a few contracts, uh, and so you know if anything I say doesn't make sense or uh, it, it's <clears throat> it's not exactly right or or totally wrong, uh, interrupt me, please. Uh, call me out, say something in the chat, uh, you know, jump on here with stage, you know, uh, you throw, throw, throw sticks and stones if you like, uh, just, uh, just say something so that we can all level up uh, together. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So uh, with that, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to dive in uh, to the presentation. So let me just uh, share my screen here and uh, away we go. All right. So uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully everybody can see uh, this near 102. Looks like I'm I'm broadcasting. So um, and this is this is again at the, at that URL uh, bitly slash near 102. <clears throat> so uh, first question you might be asking if you're coming from Ethereum is uh, why near? So here uh, are a few reasons for you. So uh, near is cheaper, faster, and easier to use than uh, other uh, uh, layer one technologies is is our claim, and it seems to to bear out in in feedback that we're getting from people in the developer community. They say they love our DevX and and so on. Um, so I've broken this up into just two categories here: development and production. From a development perspective, when you're building with uh, near, you're building. Uh, contracts that are um, uh, are written in assembly script or Rust, um, and and they compile to Wasm. So, you know, Rust is a mature language, mature compiler, huge community, and and the Rust to Wasm um, uh, pipeline uh, development process and, and tooling and stuff is is uh, the maybe the most mature uh, out there in terms of targeting Wasm. Uh, assembly script, uh, on the other hand, is very familiar for JavaScript and TypeScript developers. So, if you're coming from Front end dev or, or no dev uh, assembly script is, is really easy to pick up. Actually, it's it just a few few hours, few days, maybe to get your head around some of the near specific constructs, uh, near specific abstractions or whatever. It's like you're just trying to figure out how near works, but but the code itself gets right out of your way. So Rust is a little bit more of a learning curve in that sense. Um, but uh, but that makes it uh, definitely cheaper and, and faster for a few reasons: easier to find devs, uh, the tool chain uh, you know speeds up your your development, um, and and also uh, we have an account system which is like ENS basically um, uh, baked into the, the protocol. So you use, you know, friendly names, um, and then uh, th those names are, uh, they represent an account, and that account, uh, you then uh, choose whether or not you want to deploy a contract to it. You can have sub-accounts, uh, like DNS naming, you know, so uh, maybe uh, me.testnet, and then I might have like contract one.me.testnet, contract two.me.testnet, and so on. Um, and so uh, when you make an account, that it's just an, an account name, a string label, and then you, you can choose whether or not you want to deploy a contract to it, basically. That, that's a choice that you make. If you have the full access private keys to the account, you can deploy and redeploy and overwrite that contract as many times as you want. That's completely different from Ethereum. Um, and that contract maintains, uh, you know, uh, any number of keys. So you can have, you know, an unlimited number of keys of two types, full access keys, which give you complete control over the account or function call access keys, which are uh, basically a, um, a scoped key with an allowance uh, and specific methods on the contract that you can call. Uh, you can dial this stuff up or down. So no methods means you can call anything. Some methods means you can only call those. Um, and uh, and then you you can invoke that. And in fact, you can use that as a as a proxy to uh, allow account A to give you an allowance to call account B using their funds. Uh, so there's a, a few interesting dynamics that you can do with that. Um, and also accounts um, are rewarded 30% of the, the validator rewards uh, per block. So uh, that's a, a mechanism that, that pays out developers um, in, in a, a unique and interesting way. So, uh, and that's configurable at Genesis, that 30%. So, um, uh, so then on the production side, uh, we've got these optimizations built into the protocol. So uh, NIR is, is basically, you know, t 10 to 100x uh, uh, lower costs for these primitive operations than, than Ethereum is uh, in terms of, of the gas costs. Um, and uh, and I, as I mentioned, uh, accounts earn part of these transaction fees. Um, accounts are also re redistributed by the protocol automatically around shards. So if you get a shard that gets pretty hot, like you know CryptoKitties account or something like that, then the protocol will move that over over to its own shard uh, and and let the other ones kind of run uh, you know on on their own. <clears throat> we currently in mainnet we're running one shard um, and in testnet one shard, but there is a guild uh, called the. 
the right now kind of Arizona operating mechanism and 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 you know um, that that's improving as as we go along, and then. Um, the block time is, is fast as well. One second block time with three second finality. So that, that's uh, you know high, high performance network. You, you, it's snappy, moves fast. Okay, so uh, that's why. Um, there are uh, several examples and starters. Near.dev, uh, it's just a URL you can go to, near.dev, and it'll open up you know several different uh, examples for you. These are full stack examples, most of them. Uh, in Rust and AssemblyScript, uh, you'll have you know some examples in, in each, uh, and, a, and a few in, in both, actually, so you can compare and contrast there. Um, and uh, some of them have very well commented code, so it's it's pretty easy for you to explore and, and kind of dig into that stuff. Uh, and, and of course, some of these examples, we, we've done our best uh, to, to make them kind of a canonical use of, you know, like the kind of best practice use of some of these uh, these examples that we have. So hopefully that uh, helps. Um, and then of course, you can get started in a couple of minutes. So npx create dash near dash app, whatever your app name is, there's the URL for it at the top, the, the repo. Uh, that'll generate an, an app template for you. You can get started uh, right away. Uh, and um, uh, you can choose a uh, front end uh, of React or plain JS and a, a contract of Rust or assembly script. There's also a cookbook here of recipes created by uh, one of our developers, Yifeng Ma, who, um, who put together this cookbook of, of basically combos. So if you're coming from Ethereum, you want to know how to do something, you can do it in assembly script or Rust on Near. That's in that cookbook. So Theophorix asking, can you touch on how child accounts work? Yeah, like my.wallet.near. Uh, so if I have an account like, um, you know, wallet.near, and then I have a sub account, my uh, dot wallet. It, it's just it's just another account. So to to try and answer your question, Thiefork, I recognize your name from from previous uh, presentations, assuming you're the same person. So uh, I I'm going to try and answer this to the level of sophistication that I expect that you're asking. So um, when when you make an account, um, that that account, uh, say wallet.near. Uh, is the only account that's allowed to create sub accounts on wallet.near. So, so you have the the full access, private keys to wallet.near. Uh, then you and only you can create sub accounts. I, I can't reach over from my account and create that sub account. So that, that's one thing. Um, the the other thing is that uh, these accounts are are independent. So it's just a naming scope mechanism uh, in the sense that they're all full you know, full-blown accounts. There's not like a kind of account light or something that you're talking about. They're all accounts with the same thing. So they've got, it's the account name. They've got their, you know, a contract may or may not be deployed to that account. They've got their own collection of keys. They've got their own state. They're living on a shard. Um, and all accounts are presumed to live on their own shard, even though there's only one shard in the system. The way uh, calls happen between uh, accounts and between contracts. It's just it's it's you know account agnostic. So whether you're calling a sub account or some completely different account, the call still goes through the same uh, cross contract call routing mechanism uh, that we'll discuss a little bit later today. So in that sense, sub accounts are exactly like regular accounts, uh, but they're just scoped to your name. So you, you control them. And, and, and so you might think, for example, you have, you could have like a, a brand dot, you know, whatever your TLD is. Uh, and, and then below that brand, you might have several contracts that are, you know, or, or products, several contracts that, that are living on those accounts uh, as sub accounts. Uh, that, that might be a good way to kind of logically organize it. I use it for you know my name dot testnet, and then I might you know throw examples up on the sub accounts, and uh, and and typically I won't have a significant contract on on my own account uh, there, uh, but um, uh, because I have full access private keys to to my account, I can swap contracts in and out. So uh, with uh, with accounts, there's this mechanism. Uh, you, you can sort of think of it. It's a bit strange coming from an Ethereum world because when you you deploy a contract. The, the um, identifier for the contract, the, the contract account is actually created from your um, uh, your, your uh, public key of, of the, the, the EOA account and the nonce. So that, that's like a, it's a deterministic kind of generated value. And then every time you redeploy even the same contract, you're gonna make a new account. So with Near, for example, you can have your account and then deploy a different contract to it. So one, thing you could imagine is you could actually deploy uh, a contract temporarily to your account, which exposes some methods that allows others, other contracts or other people to control your state, maybe giving you some you know, information or discovering something about you by reading your state, whatever it is that you want, an API for your state. And then you can overwrite that contract and shut those methods off. So that might be like 
I suppose you could think of it like a costume. Maybe it's like a dinner jacket that you put on when you go to a fancy restaurant. You kind of fit in with the crowd, whatever it is that their protocol is, whatever they need to do. And then when you leave, you know, you kind of take the jacket off, give it back to the, uh, the, 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 you know, concierge or whatever you call the person at the, the front of a fancy restaurant. And then, then you go on to your, you go on with your day, you know, in your Bermuda shorts or whatever. So uh, you, you can think of contracts as something that you can kind of swap in and out. And of course, <clears throat> that's a, a feature if we're talking about the example that I just gave, but maybe it's a liability when you talk about contracts that you want to run in a trustless manner. And so in that case, you would want to delete, uh, excuse me, uh, in that case, you would want to delete the, the full access um, uh, keys to that uh, contract and, and uh, uh, to that account, excuse me. And that way uh, you are basically stating to the world, nobody controls this uh, account with, with full access keys. This contract can't be overwritten. And of course, the, the, the caveat there is you have to make sure that the code in the contract doesn't actually add any additional keys or doesn't overwrite itself or doesn't give permission to some other contract to do that. Like, uh, So as, as long as there's no full access keys on the account, then you can't overwrite it. But uh, th there could be some uh, mechanism in the, in the uh, contract itself that allows it to, to maybe add a new full access key or maybe overwrite itself or something like that. So that, that would be the, the only kind of loophole there. Just by reading the contract code, you would know. Hopefully that answers your question, Theophoric. That's maybe just a, a lot of information about accounts and keys and how they work and in the context of subaccounts. So I don't know. If, if that's not enough, just uh, follow up with another question there. All right. So uh, same, same, but different. Here's a few dimensions. Accounts, states, transactions, gas, and blocks. So on accounts, Ethereum supports two types of accounts. You should know this if you're coming from Ethereum. Basically, uh, EOAs, externally owned accounts, and um, right on, externally owned accounts, and, and then contract accounts, right? And so EOAs, externally owned accounts, are the ones that can call contracts. Contract accounts can only react to being called. They can then maybe in turn call another contract, but they can't initiate transactions themselves. So... With Near, um, there's there's one account type, and you add an unlimited number of, of keys. And so whether that account is a contract account or, a, or an individual's account, th there's no difference. It's just an account on the system, and it has a name. And it may or may not have a contract deployed to it. And whoever has uh, keys on that account, the, the private keys to either a function call access key or a full access key, can invoke methods on that account or by a proxy to another account. Uh, so, uh, in terms of state, uh, Ethereum state is replicated across all the nodes, right? It's just like one single computer that kind of moves like one step at a time, one single threaded machine that moves one step at a time, global computer that way. With Near, you can think of it as, as multiple uh, threads, m multiple actors who are all sort of working uh, and then being coordinated uh, via some consensus mechanism. Um, your, your state is on your home shard. Uh, for your account and uh, moves with your account. So if the protocol moves your account to some other shard, your state would move it with that. Um, with a trans with uh, transactions, Ethereum supports basically, uh, and my understanding is, the, the ability to transfer uh, value, to deploy a contract, and then to invoke function calls uh, you know, on, on a contract. Uh, so with Near, you have a little bit more flexibility and you've got these eight composable actions and these actions determine what happens. So, so what are we talking about when we say actions? You, you know, things like uh, account management actions, like um, uh, create account, delete account. Uh, things like um, value management actions, like uh, send or you know, transfer uh, value and maybe stake value. Uh, things like um, uh, you know, security related transactions, like add key and delete key. When you add a key, it's one of either full access or, or uh, function call key. Um, and then finally, uh, code related actions. So deploying a contract or invoking uh, a, a method, a function call action. Uh, so call function, I guess. So so those are the, the eight, two, two per each of those categories. And and the, the idea is you can compose these into a single transaction and have that transaction then applied to whatever the, the target account is. Um, and, uh, and that may in turn generate other internal transactions in the system. If you have something like a cross-contract call, you call your contract inside that code, it calls another contract, and so on. At that point, we don't call it a transaction anymore. It's inside the network. We call it a receipt. So if you see that word anywhere, that's what a receipt is. In Ethereum, a receipt is something different. It's what you get back from uh, making a function call, I guess. In uh, Near, we call that a transaction outcome. So there's a bit of a name collision there for you. But uh, basically, receipts are what we call transactions inside the network after uh, you know we verified signatures and validated the account and all that kind of stuff. Um, in terms of gas, 
Uh, Ethereum gas price is determined by network load and, and this profit motive. So if you want <clears throat> your transactions to, to be processed quickly, you've got to you know bid up the price basically to, to kind of make things happen. With near the gas price is managed algorithmically to, to limit shard congestion, uh, congestion at, at 50%. So if the shard is kind of light, not a lot's happening, we'll drop the gas 1% uh, per second. And if the shard gets a little bit overloaded, then we'll increase the gas price 1% per second. So that, that's uh, documented in our economics white paper. But basically, it's a different mechanism for controlling the price of gas um, and, and should uh, tend to avoid spikes in price You know, when, when the network gets loaded up. Um, and so um, in terms of blocks, uh, Ethereum uses proof of work at the moment, uh, proof of stake uh, forthcoming uh, at a rate of one block per 15 seconds. Near is uh, proof of stake consensus at, at one per second. So a little bit snappier, faster finality as well, instead of, I don't know, how many minutes uh, Ethereum is taking right now for finality, near is like three second finality basically. And then you can wait obviously for, for more confidence there. Um, and then in terms of uh, some other same, same, but different comparisons. So, you know, s standards, here's some kind of, you know, uh, equivalence, uh, transaction results, special data types, payable methods, event model, and, and running a node. So again, just some lay of the land kind of stuff. With Ethereum, I'm sure you're probably familiar with ERC-20. That, that's the, the ICO craze of 2017 was, was all about ERC-20s, people writing their own and kind of publishing a white paper, Hail Mary. And uh, ERC-721 is the CryptoKitties craze. So that, that's all about uh, non-fungible tokens. So in NEAR, you've got um, the NEP-21 is similar to ERC-20 and NEP-4 is similar to ERC-721. So those are our equivalents. And the reason that there's a slight difference there is that we've uh, simplified the interface a little bit and, and tried to uh, avoid kind of some of the mistakes there and, and, and also um, take advantage of, of some of the, the, the sharding and cross-contract call mechanism, the, the asynchronous behavior that you get in near. So that, that's more or less the, the justification behind separate standards instead of just using the, the ones that came out of the, the EIP uh, mechanism on Ethereum. In terms of like, well, how do you see transaction results? With Ethereum, you're seeing them on Etherscan. With Near, you can see them in Near Explorer. So it's a, like Etherscan, but but for, for Near, and it's called the Near Explorer. It shows lots of other details as well. And then uh, you can also use Near CLI, calling Near TX status as the command, and you pass in a transaction hash, and, and you'll see the, the results of the transaction outcome. We call it, it's not a receipt at that point, it's a transaction outcome. Um, and then uh, special data types. So Ethereum has a, a few of these things. Address is one. Uh, on Near, accounts are just strings. And Rust actually has a, uh, a validation. I think uh, AssemblyScript does too. I uh, saw that recently, where you can check if an account is valid by basically validating it against um, uh, a regular expression. And then Ethereum has this mapping type. In Rust, we have collections. So storage is all key value pairs in, in Near. And then we've wrapped uh, a few of these. Um, uh, we've wrapped that key value pair with, with a few higher level collections, like a, a vector or a map or a, a double-ended queue. And by the way, all the blue text here is linked. Links. So if you click on this, it'll take you to you know whatever that thing is. In this case, for example, if you click on this, it'll take you to the uh, the near SDK RS. That's the software development kit for Rust, and this is the list of collections that are available there. Um, so if you're familiar with Rust, you want to take a look at that. That's how that works. And the, the same thing is true of, the, of this assembly script link, for example. Okay, so that that's the idea. Um, payable methods on Ethereum. So you can mark a method as payable, and that means you can send it money. Uh, there's like a fallback method. There's no fallback equivalent in, in near, by the way, but you can mark a method as payable with this uh, macro in, in Rust, uh, Rust macro, not a decorator, I guess. And uh, and then uh, and then that will uh, th you know th throw an exception basically if if you send um, if you attach some value to a call and the method is not marked as payable. In assembly script, you've got to you've got to check that yourself just by checking attached deposit. Um, and then uh, with the event model, uh, Ethereum has events. Near does not have events, uh, and so with Near, you poll for experimental changes. Uh, there's a there's a, an RPC method called experimental changes. It's documented. You poll that method, and then you get back you know whatever has changed in, in different aspects. And you can put in a filter as well, uh, so that you're not getting back uh, too much if if a lot of things has changed. Um, and then running a node uh, with uh, Ethereum, Ganache is a popular uh, uh, you know tool that you'll use to to kind of run a local node. With Near, you can use Near up to run a node that joins the network or an independent node that is uh, that operates in, in local net basically so if you want to do some stealth development or something you don't want it to be publicly available information then you would use near up as well for that uh, for for setting up local net but you could also use that to join the network Okay, so that, that's kind of the, the moving parts there. And then um, in terms of uh, deployment, uh, again, some slight differences, but uh, a lot of it is, is all the same. So you 
you still compile a contract to bytecode like you would do in Ethereum. You still compose some transaction, right? And you attach the bytecode to that transaction. In Near, the transaction can be a little bit more uh, uh, sophisticated in that you can create an account uh, by name at the same time. You can add a key to it. You can transfer value to it. So there's a few other things that you can actually do uh, that can't be done with uh, with Ethereum in terms of how you deploy that contract with the transaction. But in the end, you're going to sign and send. Whatever that trans transaction does, you're going to sign and send it. And you, in Ethereum, you're sending it to some special address, right? There's kind of this 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 bit my understanding is you got to send it to a special address which is sort of you know, known to uh to create um, a new account and deploy the contract to it with uh, near you're just sending the transaction uh to to the, the target account so if the account exists then uh, you just uh, apply the transaction there if the account doesn't exist then you would create the uh, uh, account first and then apply the transaction to deploy the contract um and so and you could do that in, in one step basically um, and then you receive the transaction outcome from near whereas uh, in in Ethereum, you would you know get back the, the the contract address. You can calculate it yourself beforehand, uh, but uh, but basically you get back this news. And then with uh, near, you can um, yeah contracts can deploy contracts theophoric. Is that wait is that the same theophoric? Are there more of you? That's that totally threw me for a loop. I, you were lowercase before, but then there was this uppercase green version of you. Is this a meme? I, I might be missing something. That's crazy. Yes, contracts can deploy contracts. That is, uh, and that's cross-contract calls basically uh, using a, a batch transaction. We'll actually cover that here. Uh, so uh, in near, you can redeploy to the same account with full access uh, keys. Nice, okay. Uh, and so, uh, and so you you remove that full access key, and that uh, that means that you you won't um, uh, you know you you won't be able to overwrite that that uh, that uh, contract account. But of course, you have to be careful because the the contract itself that you have to look at the code. The contract code itself could have some unexpected behavior there, so you got to read that. Uh, but basically, an account without full access keys uh, is is heading in the right direction for a trustless operation. So just taking a, a zoomed in look a little bit at these transactions. Nice, Nico. Um, and it looks like actually, I just want to, I hope I'm not moving too fast here and missing some questions. Oh, okay. There are some questions here. You know what? Let's just pause for a second on this slide and answer some of these questions. How and when moving the accounts to another shard happens. You know what? I'm not actually sure, Miko, what the answer to this is, but it's part of the protocol. So uh, if I go to near.org and I search for, I click on technology at the top and then papers, I'll see nightshade. So I'm, I'm here. Um, I'm here at this, at this URL, by the way. Uh, and I clicked on nightshade and then in here accounts, if I search for Um, accounts that I don't remember where it is exactly. I th I think it's I think it's part of this um, white paper. And and uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, but but I think I think it's in here uh, where uh, this is the paper I'm talking about. Uh, where if the um, uh, I'll just comment there to your answer. And, and I'll comment here as well. And so I, I think that's wh that's where it's documented where this happens. But you know, if not, we also have um, a lunch and learn series um, near.ai slash lunch, if I'm not mistaken. We'll take you there. Nope. That's it. So this URL here will take you to a lunch and learn series, where um, uh, you know Alex and Ilya and and others um, uh, on the core team, uh, Evgeny and Max, are explaining various uh, various parts of the platform. So uh, this is uh, this is what the the series looks like. Oh geez, I can't open it here. How annoying is that? Um, so, uh, so anyway, so, so near.ai slash lunch, and you'll see that lunch and learn series on YouTube. Um, okay. So hopefully that helps Miko. I'm sorry. I don't have a better answer to that. Now, why accounts are strings and not binary. Um, I assume it'd be much more efficient. Um, 
you, you know, no, L, that that's fine. Uh, you're more than welcome to ask here. I'm I'm just kind of um, a little OCD about answering these questions. So I, I opened the questions and answered first. I'm just kind of going through that list. Uh, you're more than welcome to ask here. Definitely ask a newbie question here. You're even welcome to jump on stage and ask it in person if you want to. You know, get in get in uh, headlights with me here. Uh, get on the stage lights. So, uh, or you can just post it if if it's easy enough to to write. You can also post it in the questions and answers, uh, or just write in the chat. Okay, up to you. Feel free. Uh, this is a uh, uh, a safe zone for asking any questions whatsoever. Um, yeah, nice. Okay, that's cool. Thanks for that, Nico. Um, so that's that's Crowdcast for you. So uh, why accounts are strings and not binary? I you know I don't know. Maybe uh, they're uh, represented as binary somewhere. I guess they must be. Uh, but uh, but they're human readable uh, in terms of um, uh, you know how they're um, uh, how they're presented to us. So. Um, uh, you, you know, this is something that you can kind of go spelunking into the code. If you want to go digging into the code for it, uh, you can find out exactly uh, what they look like um, in uh, near core uh, here. So um, you just take a look right there. Uh, but uh, but they they are human readable, and that's, that's just part of the part of the um, the account system uh, at the at the the lowest level. Also, the Nomicon has a little bit more on this. Uh, that uh, that might be interesting for you, uh, but uh, but these accounts are are just represented, um, uh, you know, as as text right right in the the core of the platform. So that that's my understanding. Okay, so hopefully that helps, uh, Miko. Two two kind of uh, you, you know uh, low confidence answers for you there. Hopefully it moves the ball forward with those links that I just posted, man. Um, uh, okay, so. Um, uh, what, what next? No other questions. Um, and, uh, I think we're good to go. Uh, so let's, let's just keep trucking, but definitely interrupt. Uh, L, you didn't ask your question. Should I pause and take a breath and let you do that? If you want to just ask now, feel free. It's no problem. We're here together, hanging out. Nice. You were in the middle of doing that. Okay. Good, good timing. So, uh, decentralization. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you're, you're talking about immutability of the chain. So, um, look, my, my understanding is, um, that, that, um, no, that's fine. Uh, and there's, there are other people here who can, who can answer this. Um, so my understanding is you, you can't get, once something gets committed to the blockchain, you can't guarantee that uh, it's deleted. So even if you delete it from state, uh, there, there could be someone who's kind of, you know, kept that, uh, that record during, during some previous sync or whatever. Uh, and, uh, and I, I suppose the, the transformation that deletes it would just be the thing. And then before that, uh, it would still be there. Maybe that's that's how it works. I'm I'm not uh, uh, I'm not so uh, um, kind of uh, uh, familiar with with exactly the the, the implications of, of deleting the data, but um, for sure, like once you put it out there, it's there, uh, and so you 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 can assume that everything is public, but that doesn't mean that it needs to be plain text. So it could be encrypted in a way that you uh, are the only person who can read it because you've encrypted it with you know some secure you know private key. Um, but yeah, as Miko is saying, like you can also just make sure that no private data gets gets out into a decentralized application. So typically, what people do is they'll put the data in some other place and they'll take a hash of that data. Uh, and and then they'll put the hash on chain so that they can prove that the, the data that's somewhere else, maybe in some secure repository, is in fact the data that is being referred to on chain. So if, if that makes sense, um, I don't think you can. I, I wouldn't go so far as to say decentralization isn't good for user security. Um, I, I think it's a bit more nuanced of a conversation. So what what does security mean actually? Like you, you're you're talking about, and I, I don't mean that in some like flippant way. I mean like what does it mean to have your your data somewhere that that isn't yours you don't you don't control the data at all actually and and uh you know a, a nation state can come and say you know subpoena that data or whatever it is uh or or a, a um and you know a, a company could just take the data could shut down uh, so that there's a whole sort of a, a bit there um with uh, a blockchain and with decentralized systems 
uh, which, which may not necessarily be blockchain, by the way, you can have decentralization without blockchain, uh, then, then you're talking about a different uh, a way of, of managing your data. So you, you can certainly encrypt messages and put them out on a public blockchain and, and no one else would be able to read them until that encryption is broken. And, and then in that case, you know, obviously all bets are off. So I don't know if this is helping or not, but um, I guess the, the short answer, if I can try to, to bring it back, uh, is um, if you publish something in plain text on blockchain, then yeah, it's there for everyone to see. But if you encrypt it, then uh, no, it's it's private because no one can see it. Um, and uh, you know, given sort of state of the art uh, uh, cryptography. And then alternatively, you can put the data somewhere secure and just take a, a hash if, if you want to assert that the data that's in that secure place, whatever, is is actually the data that you're talking about. Take a hash of that data, uh, you know, which which would only be that hash for for that input data that you're talking about, and then you put that on chain. So that is sort of you know very little information, uh, you know, in in that hash. And so if if that helps, those are two ways to to kind of answer that question. All right. Uh, let's keep going, and, and I'll, I'll trust that people will interrupt if, if they want to. All right, so if we look at the shape of the transaction, Ethereum transactions, near transactions, I've, I've tried to kind of line these up together here with the metadata value and, um, and, and data uh, area here. So for metadata, we're talking about, they both have this origin idea of like, who, who is the signer? Uh, Ethereum, you, you keep V, R, and S, some components of, of the, the uh, message signing mechanism. Uh, with near, you, you actually keep the plain text signer and, and their public key as part of the transaction metadata. The destination is the rec called the recipient in, in Ethereum receiver. In your uniqueness, you've got this idea of a nonce, this number used once that you know increments as you as you use uh, keys in 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 uh, uh, in um, uh, Ethereum. The nonce is is attached to the account because the account is effectively a public private key pair. In near the nonce is attached not at the account level but at the key level because um, uh, it's the keys that are used to get things done. Uh, and then uh, there's this you know cost control. You can set a gas price and limit in near. Uh, sorry, in Ethereum, uh, in near you you would uh, handle that as, as part of signing and sending the transaction, and then there's this idea of recency in a in a um, uh, in a, 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 a proof of um, uh, a proof of stake system where you want to make sure that that uh, you're you're sending a transaction that isn't sort of out of date, and so you have to include a recent block hash within I don't know an epoch or something like that, something like twelve hours, um, uh, if if you um, if you if you want to send a transaction to the network, it has to be maybe four hours. It has to be sent within some recent period of, of clock time, actually, uh, as as measured by the the one second per block movement. Uh, so so that that's important. Um, the the value uh, you can attach ether to Ethereum transactions or near tokens to to near transactions. No surprise there. And then in terms of data, with uh, Ethereum transactions like. If you deploy a contract, the data is the contract code. If you are sending money, the data is empty. If you invoke a function call, the data contains a selector, some you know first four bytes or something of the function signature, whatever that looks like, and then the arguments. Um, I guess ABI encoded somehow, and then uh, in near the 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 data, it's not data, it's actions, and it's one of these maybe you know eight actions uh, that you you've composed into some meaningful transaction, right? So that that's kind of how how you you send the the, the command to near is you would include at least one action uh, per transaction. So uh, that that's that's how that works, okay? Uh, but you can include more. Yeah, nice. Okay, so it um, uh, looks like Miko and Al are are, uh, are engaged in this uh, thread. That's awesome, you two. Uh, please, uh, please carry on. Keep it up. Everybody else, feel free to join in on that. I'm just going to keep going here. Interrupt me if you need me. So, um, in terms of mapping some concepts, so here's here's these eight composable actions kind of listed out for you. So create account, delete account, add key, delete key, transfer, stake, deploy contract, and function call. I've tried to group them into some logical groupings. You can read the rest of the text here yourself. I'll just point out full access key and function call access key. So these are the two different kinds of keys. Uh, and uh, and full access keys let, lets you do everything on the account. Function calls restricted to, to potentially like a specific method with a certain budget. And uh, and as was recently pointed out, uh, it was new, news to me actually, you, you can set the receiver of a function call access key to be a different account. And so that way you would use that as a, as a, a basically a, a, you know, a, a budget, a budgeted proxy call so that you can, you know, account A can, can give a budget of say 10 near for anybody to call account B. And so you would call that, you know, if you have the private keys, you would call that uh, account A with that, that 
a function call access key, but because the receiver set in that function call access key is actually account B, uh, your, your call would be routed there. Uh, and then, you know, obviously whatever happens there is up to account B. So that, that was pretty interesting. All right, so <clears throat> Ethereum, um, in terms of the, the runtime here, we're talking about a custom language and a custom VM. And, and so there's some pros and cons there. And, uh, and obviously it's, it's, it's battle tested uh, with you know, the, the, the massive ecosystem and billions of dollars of locked up value. Um, so, uh, so, so that's, that's the, the Ethereum side of it. With Nier, AssemblyScript and Rust are compiled to the WASM VM. And, and the pros here is that you're using established you know, languages like Rust uh, and you, you know, this kind of low barrier to entry in assembly script if you're coming from front end dev. So that, that's the that's the benefit there. But you're compiling to WASM and there, you know, you're you're getting uh, the the benefits of of transferability, and you're you're learning these technologies. You can use them elsewhere. Uh, you've got this massive community. You've got uh, these these mature and maturing tools. So uh, that that's uh, that's the benefit. And then pros and cons between AssemblyScript and Rust. So you know, AssemblyScript is easy for JS devs to learn. It's actually uh, there's less tooling. Uh, between the assembly script that you write in the WASM that you bring out, so it's easier to read. The WebAssembly is text format, the WAT format, for example, whereas Rust, you know, it's it's state of the art in terms of WASM, um, uh, you know, compilation and uh, the the uh, the tool chain there is mature and battle hardened. So if, if you have any value in the contract that you're going to be you're going to be managing any value there, any amount of of, of money or value, then uh, we recommend Rust uh, for for the time being until assembly script catches up. All right, so here is where Nier is, is uh, markedly different from Ethereum. <clears throat> it's these cross-contract calls. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to show you uh, four here, maybe a little counterintuitively moving A, B, C, D counterclockwise from the top right. The top half of this diagram is not uh, cross-contract calls. Uh, this is just general asynchronous calls to get the shape of the thing in your head. And then the bottom half is cross-contract calls happening inside of Nier contracts. So inside of contract one, calling contract two, inside of contract one, calling contract two, that's the bottom half of this document. The top half is just to kind of give you a sense of like the shape of these things, and it kind of breaks up into this two by two. So uh, here, what we're talking about is, uh, uh, you know, promises, like you would find on MDN, if you just search for JavaScript promises, this is like the basic example, you know, do something, then do something, then do something, kind of classic management of, of asynchronous behavior in JavaScript. <clears throat> and then here we talk about batch. So this idea of like getting several transact several actions ready, packing them into a single transaction, and then signing and sending that transaction somewhere. So that's what we mean when we say batch. And so back into the contract world now, I'm in assembly script, I'm writing this, and I have this uh, need to uh, create an account called the banana.testnet. So I, I create this contract promise batch you know, you know, on the, the receiver of the banana.testnet, and I call create an account, transfer some money, add a full access key, which is the uh, you know sender public key of whoever just called this method. So they, they can now get to the banana testnet and, and invoke uh, you know whatever they uh, methods they want and do whatever they want with the account because they they're basically they have a full access key on that account. Whoever whoever called the the, the function that that runs this code. Uh, then peel the banana, create the account, transfer some money, add a full access key, and deploy a contract. Then eat the banana, create an account, transfer, add a full access key, deploy a contract. So all these would happen as being sent out uh, uh, to the network to, to do this work. Okay, all asynchronously, basically making these accounts, deploying contracts, doing all that good stuff. This we would call a batch. Uh, um, a cross contract call. So if you hear the word batch or promise batch, that's what we're talking about, uh, is these collections of actions composed into a, a transaction or effectively a receipt now that we're inside the network. And then this is the promise uh, call. This is what it looks like. So I might uh, call peel the banana using fingers would be the method on that account. Uh, no parameters and the empty quotes. Uh, and then eat the banana using my face would be the method, use face. Uh, no parameters, lots of gas. And so that, that's kind of the, the promise. And I can also attach a call back. So I can say, when, when you're done eating the banana, you know, call me back and, and you know, take care of something again on, on, on my contract. Go out, eat the banana, come back, you know, I don't know, wipe, wipe your mouth or something when you're done. So, so that, uh, that idea of, of promises. Both of these, this one and this one, happen inside of the contract code. So this is where uh, it's different from Ethereum. You can do these asynchronous calls and fire off many requests at the same time, and then they move effectively in parallel as far as clock time is concerned. All right, <clears throat> so 
Uh, let's talk about the bridge. We have a hackathon going on right now, Hack the Bridge. Um, uh, and, and the Rainbow Bridge is, is basically set up to communicate between Near and, uh, and Ethereum. And so um, uh, right now what we have enabled is the ability to lock uh, uh, tokens, ERC-20 tokens on Ethereum on the Ethereum side of the bridge, and then uh, mint an equivalent uh, wrapped token uh, near uh, e e um, uh, ERC-21 tokens on the near side of the bridge. Use them in whatever you know mechanism you want to. Transfer them, use them as some incentivization program, whatever, and then move them back uh, over to Ethereum by burning them on near and then unlocking them on Ethereum. So that's what the, the Rainbow Bridge does today. But soon we'll have the ability to do the opposite lock on near, mint on Ethereum uh, for ERC20, and the ability to move um, uh, NFTs uh, across uh, in both ways. And, and so some people are actually hacking on that for the hackathon uh, to, to you know, try and win those, those grand prizes this week. So uh, if you're curious about that, you can follow that on Discord. Uh, this is what the bridge looks like from a, a high level, and I'll just walk through this briefly. So at a, at a fundamental level, what you're saying is we have um, deployed um, in, in written in Solidity and deployed to Ethereum a near light client that follows the near headers. Uh, and uh, it just uh, basically... Um, uh, you know, uh, captures, um, uh, you know, uh, four hours of, um, uh, of, of near uh, headers. Uh, and, and so you, you kind of, um, uh, sorry, every, every four hours it sends this to you and, and, and you, um, uh, you keep all of those headers so you can verify things sort of, you know, uh, on near, you can verify things that happened a long time ago. On uh, the near protocol, we've written um, an Ethereum-like client in Rust, uh, wrote an Ethereum-like client, deployed it to near protocol, and that one um, receives um, uh, headers uh, every um, uh, every single header that uh, that happens uh, that that is um, uh, you know pr processed or, or generated on on Ethereum, and it maintains seven days worth of headers on uh, on the, uh, on near. So there's these relay programs, the circles there, which are just off-chain a node program or some you know something running as a cron job effectively or, or just you know on some some timer uh, just relaying headers from their respective networks so the ethereum to near relay sending from ethereum to, to near over to the ethereum like client written in rust living on near protocol and the near to ethereum relay listening to near sending those headers over to the near like client written in solidity living on ethereum so that that's kind of the, the base layer is we've got these these chains you know kind of watching each other using these like clients on top of that we have a layer called the provers and these provers are basically able to verify something about the chain and right now what we have is an ethereum event prover which is able to verify uh, that some event has been recorded on chain on ethereum so that's what the prover does now but it could verify other things accounts or state or something and then <clears throat> the near uh, prover verifying that uh, a contract has been executed so some some execution results of a contract were recorded on chain um, sorry of a, of a, a transaction were recorded on chain and so uh, that that's what the near prover does uh, again written in solidity living on ethereum so now we can basically make uh, 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 provable statements about the other network right and then on top of that layer we've built uh, this mechanism for transferring erc uh, 20 tokens so the way this uh, that that's that's this area here where we would lock erc20 on ethereum uh, the relay sort of notifies uh the Ethereum like client running on near that uh, this has happened. The prover, uh, you know, proves uh, evidence um, of the fact that that's happened. And then we mint, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try Theophoric. I'll try and, and expand on this a little bit. <clears throat> and then the, the prover uh, exp um, uh, proves that this this actually happened. And then the um, the minting uh, happens on, on near protocol. So it, it kind of looks like this following the steps one, two, three, four. So you can kind of see how that how that plays out, and then here's uh, here's what that looks like in action. So we've got you know a bunch of tokens on Rain. We allow the token locker. We give it escrow access to our Rain tokens, and then immediately we allow it to uh, transfer these tokens to itself to lock them up. So we're going to lock up ten Rain. So that happens. Uh, the the token locker emits this locked event. The uh, uh, some rain, but we need to pay a little bit because we're storing ownership of the, the, the fact that we're own some some 
tokens on the near side requires a little bit of storage, so we pay for that. And then now our 10 rain shows up on the other side of the bridge. And you know we can reverse the process by burning the N rain and, and unlocking the, the rain tokens. But but that's what the bridge looks like. Okay. And these same steps here with links directly uh, into uh, into this um, uh, into the code here. So um, in terms of the prover, um, I think uh, we can actually take a look at the code. Here's just another view of this as a uh, an activity diagram, I guess. Uh, uh, so so we just see kind of how this works, and I've I've tried to line up the numbers here one two three four, so you can see how these how these bits move among these different pieces here. Um, so he, here's the the prover that comes in and, and basically uh, you know l looks for the for the proof and and then checks to see that that uh, what is expected happens. Okay, so so here is. Um, yeah, so so Ethereum, so Theophoric, I, I, my intention was to actually open up the code for the prover and like and and share it with you as a link. Uh, so give me just a, a few seconds as I wrap up the 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 this this bit here. Short answer to your question is it can prove any event. So the the Ethereum prover is a generic prover that proves any event that's been recorded on chain, um, uh, on the, the Ethereum blockchain. So um, it, it, there's no there's no discernment. It doesn't care what how that event was emitted, what contract or whatever. Yeah, it just it just proves events, any event at all that you want to claim. And you you have to you have to basically ask. My understanding is you have to ask it. It has, has this event happened or, or something like that and, and then it and then it will verify that it's happened you know like you have to kind of compose the the event in a way that you can ask it that question we can take a look at the source code I haven't looked so closely at it but but I'm you know no fear let's take a look at it together so uh, here on the left hand side is the source code to the demo that you just saw uh, this ERC 20 to NEP 21 you can run it locally it's a bit of a bear um, to set up locally but we will evolve it so that you can actually set it up and, and we can just check briefly here uh, if it's if it's ready to go yeah here so this minimum viable test net 1.0 is what uh, Chad um, uh, Ostrowski who, who wrote this had promised he, he's he's responsible for, for most of this work he said as soon as we saw this 1.0 release then things should be good to go. No, it's not on mainnet right now. Um, and uh, yeah, so so um, right now we're talking about uh, Rinkeby and um, Ethereum Rinkeby testnet and uh, the near testnet. That's that's where this this bridge is is connected to. It's not on mainnet, uh, but presumably it'll be there shortly after the hackathon. That's more or less the point of the hackathon is to kick the tires on this thing, uh, get some more uh, features uh, shipped, uh, you know, internally and with the help of the community. That's you, and then um, and then uh, ship to mainnet. So uh, th there's no question that's that's part of the timeline. Uh, so this is this is you know in progress, and so what Chad said is as soon as you see the 1.0 here, then uh, we should we should see. Uh, you know something that, that you can actually uh, start using. So the cost of the gas is is actually estimated uh, in some of these other um, yeah. So so let's take a look. If if we come in here and we go to uh, the near organization and we search for uh, rainbow, that's that's what this slide here on the right hand side is. Uh, so it looks like uh, this. So, uh, so if you search here with me, uh, then we'll see that there's the bridge CLI. Go ahead and open that, and the bridge CLI will uh, tell you uh, that there there are some pretty hefty gas fees associated with this. Actually, here they are, gas costs. Um, but uh, but the Ethereum fees can be can be significant, right? Uh, so so this is uh, you know this is. Uh, um, uh, th this is the estimate, uh, you know, cur currently, basically. Uh, so, so you can check out this this readme here. It's it's quite rich. Tells you uh, what's going on and and uh, you know extensibility and, and all that sort of stuff. How to deploy and use it locally. So there's quite a bit here. And in fact, if you want to deploy this demo, you're going to need to do that. Uh, so so that's that. And then uh, if we're talking about the the prover uh, that is proving something about Ethereum, uh, it's going to be the Rust side which is what we deploy to Ethereum. If it's the, the prover on the Ethereum side, it's gonna be uh, proving things about near from Ethereum that's written in Solidity. So we can open this up. And so here's the, the Rust side and we'll see there, there's the ETH prover right there. 
uh, yeah, it might be out of date, Theophoric. Uh, you know, uh, I'll I'll fall on the sword for that one and, and just say, you know, th this is this is kind of um, uh, work in progress. Okay, so uh, it, you know, it, it may uh, it may it may be a little bit out of date. <clears throat> um, forgive us for that. Okay, so uh, so look uh, here is in the I just posted this link in this folder, the ETH prover. We can just dive in there. Uh, you'll see source. It's this. It's this one one file here. So let, let's just take a look at this and see what we can find. Um, so, um, yeah, right on. Thanks for the encouraging words. No, I, I don't. I don't. Uh, I try not to take myself too seriously. So it it, it it's uh, it's all good. Thank you. Uh, so uh, here, um, let's see what we can find. Yeah, yum yum. Um, yeah, so I think I think this this is the 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 bit here. So you're looking at this information, and then what this does is uh, it's it's grabbing these details. I think this is the part that we're talking about here, this prover, and then here's the verification, um, and uh, and then we we react to that. Um, yeah, I think this is this is it here. So, if, if it's if it's not that, then just call me out. Um, uh, and uh, and it looks like um, uh, it looks like th this is uh, this is part of it here. Uh, is is that that bit right there? Verifying the try there. So, uh, so so this is the uh, this is the prover and, and what what it can prove. So hopefully this this helps give you a sense, uh, Theophoric. I'm uh, only at the ability of, of reading Rust uh, and and lightly at that. So uh, you know some of this uh, for me, I would really have to spend some time. Yeah, awesome. I'd have to spend some more time thinking about it. Let me just maybe save you the clicks by posting this. That's the function we were just talking about. Okay, hopefully that helps. Uh, but but that's the source and it, it's all there. And again, the the way that I reasoned about that was um, by going to near, uh, the near org, searching for rainbow, which just filters it to these repositories. The CLI is what you use for standing things up. The token connector is a generic ERC-20. It's, it's not specific to rain, for example. It's just a generic ERC-20 from uh, Ethereum to near. Uh, anything that, that um, has uh, solidity is gonna live on Ethereum. So this would be the Ethereum side of the bridge written in solidity. Anything in Rust is gonna live on the uh, near side. So that, that's the Rust side of the bridge. This is some JavaScript that's been factored out for convenience of developing on the fridge, uh, on the bridge. And then this is, uh, you know, a, a fungible token, um, you know, uh, that's archived at this point. But uh, but at some point, this was the example. And, and now we're maybe using this uh, rainbow token. So hopefully that gives you a sense of, of these, uh, these repos and, and what we can do with them. And then here's the usage of the Rainbow Bridge CLI and security and gas costs as you were asking. So I, I kind of um, stole my own thunder there. So so that's uh, that's uh, this part. Okay, so that's that's it. We're done with, with kind of bridge orientation. Let's talk about actually building on near for a little bit here. We're, um, we're about at the top of the hour. Looks like there's a couple of questions. Yeah, not, nonce is uh, is sequential, uh, Miko. Let, let's just uh, let's just take a look at um, oh man, so something something's going on with. Uh, Something's going on with my computer here. I'm not getting the the I don't know what it is, a key stuck or something. Um, okay, so uh so you can see this. Uh so so near state, and then I'll I'll take a look at at you know this account that, that I've got on testnet. Um, I've got you know three thousand near uh, tokens on testnet here. I've got a contract deployed because this code hash is not default. Uh, but but I can look at another account that I have a sub account um, and call state uh, on that, and then you'll see that the the code hash here is all ones. 
which means no contract is deployed to this account, whereas there is a contract deployed to this account. So this is, you know, my name dot testnet and then sample dot Sharif.testnet.myname.testnet, right? So you can see that, that that's kind of the difference between accounts. It's not because of their sub-account account relationship. It's just because this account doesn't have any contract deployed to it. And then I can check keys as well. So, um, so here I'll see that there is a, a public key matching a, a private key that I have access to locally. Uh, it's a full access key, and there, the nonce is zero. I haven't used this key for anything. Okay, uh, here is another uh, um, list of keys. So you can check this for any account. Again, this is all public information. There's a lot of keys on this account. Here's the full access, here is a full access key uh, with a nonce of zero. And alternatively, here's maybe the first key that I set up on this account has a nonce of 62. So it just increments, you know, zero, one, two, three, every time you use the account in order to make sure that transactions are unique, um, uh, you know, as, as they're signed. And so here, this is a, a function call access key. And you can see that basically uh, this, this account, not, not my account, but this account, uh, is the one that has access, uh, is, is getting, uh, is, is getting the, the, the receipt of a call. It's the one that the, the transaction is being applied to. Uh, this is the allowance for calling it, the nonce is zero, and there's no method names uh, in here. Let's see if we can find one with some method names. Uh, I don't have any here. Uh, but basically a bunch of, of full ac uh, function call access, or a little bit more complicated structure, and then some full access uh, keys here. So you can see that the nonce is, is always specific to the key. So hopefully that, that helps uh, give you a sense of how that works. Um, and yeah, Theophoric, the, there's, there's no... So when you say from within a contract, um, let's, let's get... Uh, let's get let's get right into it. When you're when you're in a contract, so near SDK AS and near SDK RS, let's let's just go right into the 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 the, the thick woods here and see what this looks like. When you're inside of a contract, uh, what do you see? Um, is what am I looking for? Um, why am I not finding it? Um, yeah, the, the Rust and assembly script SDKs are, are close. Has this been factored out into a different, uh huh? Okay. Haven't looked at it in a while, my mistake, sorry about that. So here, here's a bunch of the stuff that you get from, you know, like logging, for example. Uh, this is how you how you log. Uh, so the log, the log function takes a, um, a message of, of type uh, string and then um, in, encodes it and, um, uh, and logs it out here just by appending it to, um, uh, to a, a collection there. Yeah, so, so they're, 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 we try and keep parity Theophoric is the answer, but there there are some differences. Payable is one of the differences, and then I'm I'm actually looking at this um, uh, ENV file to show you the difference here. Uh, so, um, uh, if we can get to the environment so I, I want to show you that that there is some equivalence here um, so so here is let's say the context API so we're looking at assembly script near SDK AS on the left and near SDK RS on the right um, so there is some like naming equivalent, right? So, so when you're inside a contract, this is what you have access to. You can, you can reach out of the contract into the environment and grab these things basically by reading and writing to registers in the VM, right? So signer account ID, signer account ID, you know, signer account private key, a public key, sorry, signer account public key. So you'll see there's some parity here, but then sometimes there'll be something that's slightly different. So and let me see if I can find an example of that. Um, so, um, 
yeah i mean may, may, maybe maybe that maybe the parody's gotten better and it's just it's just a, a an old memory of mine uh but anyway look you get the idea so this is how you would check <clears throat> parity between these two it's these two files so i'll, I'll just post them uh right here into the um uh into the present into the presentation um Okay, so that, that's the assembly script. Uh, and then here is the uh, Rust. So this is like the, this is the, the context. This is basically what you can do from inside of a contract. And then you can also apply those eight transactions, the, the eight actions, excuse me. And none of those that I'm aware of give you access to keys on other accounts. So um, I, I think, uh, I think that that's the short answer is you, you can't get that information from inside of a contract, uh, but you could get it from outside by asking an Oracle to check uh, the, uh, the, you know, uh, near network uh, using uh, near API.js or the RPC interface or, um, uh, or, uh, or near shell, and then to, to inform your contract of what keys are available on, on itself or, or on some other contract. So hopefully that helps. <clears throat> and then just, uh, I think you've got a couple of questions here. Let me just see if I can kind of go down the list and, um, um, and, uh, and address them. So, so Miko, uh, these are deterministic incremented per use of each key. And, um, yeah, we said the Rust and the, the assembly script SDKs are, are close to equivalent, if not exactly equivalent. There's some there's some slight gaps between them. You give a good example here of the payable uh, macro in, in Rust. It's not available in, in uh, assembly script as far as I'm aware. Um, and to go over a high level tour of the repos, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, we can fly through that. And then is there a registry somewhere matching contract code with WASM hash? No, <clears throat> uh, there, there's nothing like that. And, and in fact, and we don't yet have, I think a, um, a published mechanism for deterministic compilation of contracts. So like when you write a contract uh, and and uh, and compile it. If you compile it on your machine, the fingerprint, the code hash, might come out slightly differently on my machine. Um, and so, so to to get that deterministic compilation, we're we're working on that. We're aware that that's a critical piece for for trustless operation security in in many contexts. And so, um, that that's something that we're we're chipping away at. But uh, you, you can you can basically make your own registry if you want to. Um, and uh, and so you know, but there's no there's no published public re registry like that. Um, and the the NV API is is quite stable. It's um, fairly slow slow moving. Uh, so it's I think it's you know, in terms of the assembly script API, maybe it's changed. Gosh, I don't know, just to pull a number out, five or ten percent in the last year. Uh, so so it's fairly it's fairly stable. Uh, the the APIs. Um, okay, so hopefully hopefully that helps. Uh, and then we can come back to some of these um, uh, some of these contracts, uh, some of these repos a little bit later, Theophoric. Th thanks for the questions. Keep them coming. Um, I'll do my best to keep up with you. Uh, and if I can't answer any questions, uh, you know, effectively here, just just dive into Discord and, and ask again. And you know, um, there, there's definitely a lot of people in the community, uh, many many of whom know much more than I do about this technology. So, um, all right, keep it coming. Awesome, awesome. So, how do I get started? If you haven't done this before, do it right now. If you've got Node installed locally, just r run npx create dash near dash app. Uh, uh, dash dash help will give you the interface that you see on the screen here. But basically, this is how you can create a, a boilerplate. It's modeled after React. Uh, create React app. So npx create near app, and then you know uh, whatever your app name is, it'll generate a folder. By default, you'll get a vanilla application with assembly script contract. I would recommend that you do that. Don't start with the Rust contract uh, because you'll need a build environment and it'll take you a little bit more time to compile the contract. Just stick with assembly script, stick with the default for now as you get used to this. Obviously, later, if you want to try Rust, you should do that. But if it's the first time you've run this, just go with the defaults. npx create dash near dash app, give it a name, it'll generate plain vanilla JavaScript and assembly script back end of the contract for you. Um, okay, so uh, that that's what that does. Here's what it looks like in terms of the interface, uh, sorry, in terms of the file system. The, this is the, the impact of your choice, basically. So 
uh, you can see that the, the folders more or less line up. There's slight differences. You can kind of scan this this page to see the differences uh, in, in the file system. Al almost exactly the same with some slight differences depending on the choices that you make. My recommendation is if it's the first time you're running this, stick with JavaScript and AssemblyScript. Okay, so let, let's do it. npx create uh, dash near dash app. And then there's this, uh, 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 you know, npm or, or yarn uh, script um, dev here that'll set up node mon, watch the assembly folder for you, recompile the contract if you make any changes. It's good for, for iteration. And then there's a bunch of these other uh, scripts here that you can use to build the contract or, you know, um, uh, you know whatever you want to get done. So, uh, and then and then obviously the test will run um, uh, tests on, on the... Um, uh, the contract, depending on the contract language that you choose, uh, that, that changes, I believe. Okay, so w when you run yarn dev, uh, if you've never logged into a local host application uh, before, it'll it'll look like this on the left-hand side. You sign in, and it'll redirect you. Notice the URL difference going from localhost1234 to wallet.testnet.near.org. And there, if you've never created an account before, you'll be presented with this ability to create an account, so you should do that. Uh, and, uh, and set up your recovery phrase and all that kind of good stuff. And then you'll be redirected back to um, the application and, uh, or, you know, go there yourself if you're in the middle of you know, sort of wind up in the wallet after your, your account creation. And then you'll end up in this uh, application where you say, you see the word hello and then whatever the account name is that you set up. And here you can change the greeting. So you type that in, the save button lights up so you can click it. That'll make a change on chain. You'll get this little toast at the bottom, uh, what the, the, the B is pointing to at the bottom here. That represents that the, the method has been called. And you'll see all this in, in the Explorer actually. Uh, as as your your changes are recorded on chain, so um, uh, you know all, all of this to get a demo application running in, in really just a minute or two. It is this fast, and now uh, of course you can explore the code. And, and here are some questions for you to encourage you to to do so. So if you want to kind of discover how this thing works, um, you know you can ask yourself where do we set up a connection to near? You know, search for key key store if you're looking for a hint. How do we log in to the wallet? Search for request sign in if you want to find that. Which lines of, of code are wiring up the contract? So basically we set up this, this contract object and then we wire some methods to it. You can search for view methods or change methods to see that. And then in terms of control, if you're coming from Ethereum, this is kind of an obvious statement for you, but a, a big sort of, uh, you, you can try sort of changing this to, to reverse the greeting string, but a big part of your, your design decisions when you're working on, in a blockchain environment is you want to decide what do you put in the contract and what do you leave off of the contract. For every line of code that you put on the contract, you're spending more computational resources and more time and more money essentially on chain. And this is a, a, an expensive resource fundamentally, right? You, you've got sort of a, you only got a second to do all the work that's going to happen on that one shard in, in near, you've got 15 seconds on Ethereum. So there's a little window to do all that work, whatever it is. So you got to fit it in that window. And of course, you know, you're going to pay for those resources you know, whatever the price of gas is at the time, you'll you'll pay for that. Uh, and and then you'll pay for storage, potentially on near its storage staking. So you'll lock up some of your near tokens uh, to, to write some data. That's what that small payment was in, in the bridge that you saw on the near side where you sent 0.06 near or something to, to, to cover the cost of storing the fact that we have some, you know, tokens on the near side. Basically, there's that, that entry in the record costs a little bit of, of storage to be staked locks up. As soon as you delete the data, you get that stake back. It's that mechanism of storage staking that we talk about. And so in this case, like if you're going to reverse a string in this contract, you, you could, it's a fairly simple example. Maybe it doesn't make too much sense, but it, it's worth recognizing that, that this is a choice. You either make the, the, the you re reverse the string in, in, the, in the JavaScript on the client side before you write it to the contract. That's fine. But then there's no public record of the fact that you're reversing the string. So who knows if it's reversed or not. Or you could reverse it on chain, in which case there's a public record that it's been it's been reversed, whatever input you give it. And so that, that becomes part of the contract, becomes, you know, code is law, that becomes part of the law of the contract. But it costs you more to do that. So that, that's kind of trade-off. The same thing that you would see in Ethereum as well. Uh, what you encode on the contract uh, is, is a choice that you have to make very carefully. Okay, so what just happened, uh, you know, as we as we built that, assuming that, that you took a minute to do that and, and stood it up uh, and saw that work, then you've got basically two sides of development uh, near SDK uh, assembly script AS or RS for Rust. Uh, on the contract side, you build out the user experience using near API JS or, or the JSON RPC. Uh, if you're not working in a JavaScript context, that's how you build on near contracts and, and the, the front end. And then uh, you know you've got this uh, this application. It's basically your application like this. 
uh, you have near API JS, so you're using that, you code in assembly script or Rust for your contracts, you deploy them, uh, and then um, when you make that call, it follows this path. So from near API JS, your, your app makes a call, it sends the, you know, the, the, the transaction through the RPC interface, uh, the blockchain layer uh, spins up the runtime, applies the transaction, that brings up a virtual machine, your code is loaded onto the virtual machine, it's invoked, does its thing, reads and writes to, to storage, comes back across the network, gets you know uh, captured in, in block storage permanently on chain, you get the response. So this sort of flow here is, is what's happening. And we can zoom in a little bit on the state storage, you'll recognize the top half is the metadata that we saw when we type you know, near state account. Uh, whatever the account name was, so, so near CLI, near, space, state, space, whatever the account name is, will produce that first block, the metadata block at the top about the contract. And then the bottom is state storage. That's actually the data that's being stored in your account, the key value pairs, in this case encoded as base64. So that, that's what's going on under the hood. And if we decode that base64, you'll see that there's a variable called state. If you're building with Rust and you've deployed a Rust contract, the contract code will get serialized with whatever data that you're storing in there. Uh, and, and saved into the state variable. It's a, a special variable name there, all caps S-T-A-T-E. And then any other key value pairs that you put in, in storage. So a message with some text or a counter with some number. And then if you use any of the collections, you'll get this prefix double colon with whatever the, the identifier is. So maybe it's like, you know, prefix, you know, colon, colon, letter, uh, L-E-N for the length of a, of a vector, an array, you know, things like that. So, so that's how, that's what the, the state looks like, okay? So um, in terms of writing contracts, we're basically writing in assembly script or Rust. Here, here they are side by side. Uh, please forgive that the, the contract side isn't tested, but it more or less looks like this. So if you try and copy this code exactly, you may have some, some issues with some you know, Rust screaming at you about mismatched types or something like that. But um, I did my best to faithfully re recreate these. The assembly script one does work and the, the Rust is still in progress. So. Um, the, the idea here, this is, you know, some guest book application. There's a posted message. We've got these three bits of data, premium, you know, whether or not the message is premium, we've attached some money, uh, who the sender was, what the text is of the message. And we can see that the attached deposit compared with, you know, 0.1 near or whatever that number is, is the, the thing that makes us decide whether or not the message is premium. And then on the Rust side, it looks a little bit like this. You've got this struct, uh, both the, the class in assembly script and the struct uh, in uh, Rust have to be uh, tagged with a near bind gen. So in, in, uh, in assembly script, it's at near bind gen, some attribute, a decorator that you decorate the class with. In, in Rust, it's a macro, the near bind gen macro. Um, and then you have to uh, also uh, decorate the, the struct with some serialization, deserialization uh, uh, tools there. Uh, Borsch is a, a custom uh, mechanism for, for serializing and deserializing data on chain. And then you add near bind gen um, a macro to whatever the implementation is of that struct, add whatever methods that you want. Um, and so, so that's, that's what that looks like. So uh, in terms of the behavior uh, of the contract in assembly script, uh, you know, we've got uh, add message and get messages. This is for the, the guest book example on near.dev. Uh, and so here we can take in a message uh, text wrap it with a posted message, push that onto the messages collection that was, um, uh, that, that's uh, you know, available as a persistent vector on the, the assembly script side. And then uh, get messages, we can pull the, the messages out, uh, iterate over them you know, with some message limit, think of it like pagination. And then we get back this array of posted messages. On the Rust side, it looks a little bit like this. And again, please forgive, uh, this, this may not actually compile exactly, but it's close on the, the Rust side. So again, we've got this guest book, uh, struct that represents the, um, uh, the the contract and then the implementation of the guestbook to add a message and get messages there. Okay, so that's kind of what you get there. It's, it's a public struct there. Okay, so so hopefully that uh, that gives you a sense of, of how that works. Um, and no matter what you do, the, the output is always going to be a WASM file. So that, that's your contract. The, the WAT, uh, WebAssembly is text, is what you see on the left here, is easier to read in assembly script. Uh, it, it just looks cleaner. You can actually look at it and see, kind of count through the operations and, and see how it's how it's um, manipulating the data. So so it's it's a little bit uh, easier to read in, if it's coming out of assembly script. But uh, no matter what, uh, both Rust and, and assembly script are compiling uh, to a WASM file. That's your contract. Okay. And so here's the guestbook application that we just discussed at a low level. Uh, you've got this interface. Uh, you've got these folders. Uh, this is an assembly script example. Um, and so this would be similar to what you just produced a minute ago. And then here, uh, you know, you got the model. So we just saw this. 
You've got the main, we just saw that. Configuration, this gives you access to the network. Uh, what are the endpoints? Index for connecting to the network, wiring up your contract at the bottom right there. Um, so the, these methods, get messages and set messages actually get attached to the contract object. And then uh, the application can you know, request to sign in and sign out using the wallet these two methods and then we can get messages and then uh, you know uh, add a message and then get messages uh, and so um, uh, and so you, you can see kind of the flow right there and and that's that's the end of this presentation the the last five or ten slides are covered much in much more detail much more slowly in near 101 so bit.ly slash near dash 101 uh, you'll find slides there with five or six recordings of the presentation. So if you want to go over those last few slides, these right here, more slowly and more carefully, uh, then, then you, you sh are more than welcome to go check out uh, NEAR 101. So I was just kind of going through them here for completeness. Uh, and you should find us here on NEAR.help, uh, NEAR.chat also. Uh, we'll get you to, uh, to uh, Discord and Telegram. Uh, so um, uh, Theophoric, back to your question here. So how similar are the WASM binaries produced? Um, so I think they're they're similar in size. The assembly script binaries are a little bit smaller, but you can there's some optimization switches that'll shrink the Rust binaries closely. Um, so I think the assembly script binaries just have they have less stuff in them, and so they're they're because the assembly script compiler is closer to the to the metal in that case. There's there's less tooling there, um, and so uh, in terms of of op operations for gas costs, I I. I'm sure we're doing some analysis on this right now because I've heard the, heard the conversation about gas estimation and, and, and gas costs uh, uh, kind of batted around a lot recently internally. And so uh, I know we're thinking about that. Uh, I think the short answer is um, assembly script can be a little bit cheaper. Um, the instructions are, are fewer um, as evidenced by the fact that the WAT is easier to read. It's, it's a smaller file um, and it's closer to the assembly script that you're writing. Uh, the, the Rust contracts might be a little bit more expensive to run, uh, but but not not by much. Uh, it's a, maybe some some small factor or, or a small multiple. Um, it seems like a, a worthy uh, thing to test actually. And um, and then uh, in terms of storage, the the when you you're paying you know you're staking your tokens against storing the contract, so there's going to be some cost there. And the, the, they're about the same size, but the Rust uh, binaries are a little bit a little bit bigger. Okay, so hopefully that. Um, that answers your question. We're just a few minutes uh, here um, before 10 uh, 30. So uh, sorry, before the 30 minutes, uh, nine, the 90 minute mark. So if, if there uh, are any questions, uh, let's, uh, let's dig into them now. Um, I think we we're done here with the, with the presentation and we can just, um, we can do that. And then maybe I can send out another poll. Uh, how was this workshop? All right, so I've just posted this. If you wouldn't mind answering um, uh, this uh, question, you know, give me some feedback about the workshop. I, I promise you, you won't hurt my feelings. Um, I'm, I'm really just interested in some, uh, some, uh, you know, concrete uh, sense of, of how we're doing here. If you have any um, constructive criticism, wide open to it. By the way, we would love to hear from you, um, either here in the chat right now, over Telegram, Discord, in a public channel. Um, you, you know, this is uh, th this this is uh, something that we're doing for you uh, to to you know uh, get to know near and and uh, you know learn uh, you know about what you can build and, and and get started with it. So if if it's if it's not uh, you know uh, exactly what you need, if, if you have some ideas about how we can improve it, all ears wide open to that. Uh, please let us know. Um, and then uh, other than that, I think. Um, you know, if there are, we can make a few more minutes for other questions, but if there aren't any other questions, we can we can uh, you know wrap. Um, let's see. So, any other questions? I'll I'll hang for a, a few minutes here, just give people a chance to ask. Any other questions, comments, anything else we want to discuss?
All right, well, it, it seems pretty quiet. So if there's nothing else, uh, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. This is a pleasure. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're watching this recording, hopefully it was a good use of your time. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, and uh, if, you're, if you're hacking with us this week in the Hack the Rainbow, uh, best luck. Um, I know the judges are really excited to see uh, what comes out of this experience. And, and of course, we, we can't wait to see what you build. Uh, have fun um, hacking on Nier, and, and thanks for hanging out. See ya.